we're here meditating today in honor of the Buddha, because today marks the day, the full moon day in May, when he was born. And then 35 years later, on the full moon day in May, came to awakening. And then 45 years after that, on the full moon day in May, he entered Nibbana, totally. And so today is a good day to look to think about him. Of course, we should be thinking about the Buddha every day, because in his awakening he found something really important that has a bearing on every day for us, which is that human action can find true happiness. It can be attained by training the mind. And so we should think about that all the time, because as we make our choices going through life, we should always keep in mind the, the fact that there is that possibility that if we train our minds, we can find true happiness. We have to watch out for the things that would get in the way. As the Buddha said, your two most important possessions are right view and virtue. It's based on these that you can develop mindfulness, and through mindfulness you can get the mind into concentration. So you want to make sure that these foundations are really strong. Right view starts, of course, with the principle that if you act on skillful intentions, the results are going to be good for the long term. If you act on unskillful intentions, the results are going to be bad for the long term. And you have to hold to that view all the time. It's not something you, you just talk about only while you're in the monastery, or just during the hour where you're going to sit and meditate. This is something that should inform all your actions. It's one of those laws that applies 24-7. It's not like a traffic law that, say, you can park here on Wednesdays and Thursdays, but you can't park here on, on Sundays and Fridays. And it doesn't come in and out of influence based on what you want. It's there all the time. So when you think about that, you have to realize, okay, you've got to be very careful about how you act. And from there comes the basic principle for virtue, which is that you're not going to act in ways that are going to cause harm to anybody. You're not going to kill animals. You're not going to steal anything. You're not going to have illicit sex. You're not going to lie. You're not going to take intoxicants. In this way, you protect others, but you, more importantly, you protect yourself. And as you observe the precepts, it provide a good foundation for getting the mind into concentration through mindfulness. Because on the one hand, the simple fact that you sit down, close your eyes, try to make the mind still, and you look back on your actions for the day, and you realize you haven't harmed anybody at all. It gives rise to a sense of joy, a sense of well-being inside, a sense of self-esteem. And those things are really useful for when you're going to work on concentration, because sometimes it gets frustrating. You try to get the mind to settle down, and it seems to be just full of thoughts. It's like herding cats. Well, the image they give in Thailand is catching crabs to put into a basket. You get the first crab in the basket, and by the time you reach down and get the second crab, the first crab is already calling out. In times like that, you have to remind yourself, well, yes, you do have some goodness inside. And at the same time, you've learned already some of the skills that you're going to need to meditate. Because when the Buddha talks about getting the mind established, he says there are three qualities that you have to bring to it. One is mindfulness, the ability to keep something in mind. Two is alertness, your ability to watch what you're doing. And then three is atapa, or ardency. You really try to do this well. Now, if you've been observing the precepts, you already have some practice in these qualities. Because to observe a precept, one, you have to keep it in mind. That's mindfulness. Two, you have to watch your behavior to make sure that it stays in line with the precept. That's alertness. And in times when it's difficult, you figure out ways that you can get around the difficulties, but at the same time not break the precept. I was reading so someone saying that bringing discernment to the precepts means knowing when to observe them and when not. But that's lazy discernment. And it's not really wise. Wise discernment figures out, say, for example, you have some 
information that you know that someone else would like to get for, out of you, and they would like to abuse that information once they get it. You have to figure out some way to avoid that topic of conversation, not give the information, but without lying. Now that sets the bar higher. And there are going to be problems like that or difficulties just like that with all the precepts. But if you make an effort to maintain the precept, even if the difficulty is simply the fact that, say, the people around you are drinking and you don't want to drink, and they could start putting pressure on you, how you withstand the pressure in such a way that you don't insult them, but at the same time you hold your ground. I mean, you can observe the precepts in that way, but that's how you develop discernment. That's the ardency here. So these qualities, mindfulness, alertness, and ardency, these are precisely what you need to get the mind to settle down. Like you are mindful of the breath, and then you are alert to watch both the breath and the mind, to make sure they stay together. And then you put forth an effort. Figure out if they're not staying together, is it the problem with the mind or is it the problem with the breath? Or is it something else interfering? When you figure out what the interference is, and you can put it into it. Because the interference, the Buddha says, is not so much things coming at you from outside, it's what the mind is doing to itself, saying to itself, thinking to itself. If you can figure out how to change the conversation inside. And you've gone a long ways to making it a lot easier to observe the precept on the external level as well. So these are some of the ways in which having views made straight, as the Buddha calls them, and precepts that are pleasing to the noble ones. When you have these two qualities, then it's a lot easier for the mind to settle down. As you've learned the skills you need to meditate, you have a sense of your own confidence in yourself, joy in the Buddhist teachings. So this is one of the reasons why the Buddha put right speech, right action, and livelihood in, into the factors of the path. Because they build on right view and right, right resolve. And they lead to right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. They're your most precious possessions. The Buddha talks about this in the context of things you might lose as you observe the precepts. Because there will be times when, in the, in the eyes of the world, you're put at a disadvantage when you're observing the precepts. Other people can make money by lying, but that avenue is closed off to you. So you may have to suffer a loss of wealth for a while. You may have relatives who want you to lie, and you have to say no. And they may get really upset, but you have to realize that when you're dying, your relatives can't come and help you make sure that you go to a good place. It's going to depend on you and your past actions and your present actions at that time. So you don't want to do anything that's going to create difficulties then. That's really between you and you. So other people try to pressure you into drinking or breaking the precepts in other ways. You have to remind yourself that this is where your wealth lies, in maintaining your precepts. And you have to learn how to say no to your friends in a way that doesn't insult them. So in this way, you develop wisdom, discernment, compassion through the precepts. You develop purity by observing the precepts. And these are all qualities of the Buddha. In fact, these are his three main qualities. Wisdom, compassion, purity. And you develop them by looking for happiness in a mature way, a wise way. The Buddha never says that you should sacrifice your happiness for other people. Because as he says, when, we, when you say sacrifice your happiness, it means breaking the precepts. You never break the precepts for anybody else's sake, because the precepts are more valuable than any of your other possessions.
You could lose your wealth, you could lose your health, you could even lose your relatives. And the Buddha said, it's not all that serious. But if you lose your precepts and you lose your right view, that loss can harm you for a long, long time. So do your best to stick by the precepts, even when it's hard. And the more you can stick with them, even when it's hard, figure out ways to make it easier, but at the same time not break the precept, then you've developed a lot of good qualities in mind. Qualities that will lead to your happiness in this life and the next, and then the happiness and well-being of others. This is a practice that's good all around.